Hi, my name is Bishop Jack Vaughn, and I am the Pastor Emeritus here at Evangelistic Center Church. We just want to say thank you so much for tuning in from wherever you may be viewing us from. If you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. We believe God has a word just for you. So let's jump in to this amazing message. Acts chapter 2, um, verses 1 through 4. Acts chapter 2, it's New Testament, uh, verses 1 through 4. Um, in the message translation, it reads, When the Feast of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, a strong force that no one could tell where it, could, where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread throughout their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. Um, the, new, the Living Bible translation says, Seven weeks had gone by since Jesus' death and resurrection and the day of Pentecost had now arrived as the believers met together that day. Suddenly, there was a sound like a roaring of a mighty windstorm in the skies above them, and it filled the house where they were meeting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on their heads. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in languages that they didn't know, for the Holy Spirit had given them the ability. Last version is the voice version. It says, when the holy day of Pentecost had come, after 50 days after the Passover, they were gathered together in one place. Picture this among yourselves, among the disciples. A sound roars from the sky without warning. The roar of a violent wind and the whole house where you are gathered reverberates with the sound. Then flame appears, dividing into smaller pieces and smaller flames and spreading from one person to the next. All the people present are filled with the Holy Spirit and begin to speak in languages they've never spoken as the Spirit empowers them. Um, just for a few minutes... Um, we want to talk from a subject as we close out this series, Making the Band. Making the Band. Father God, we thank you today for your word. I ask that you will bless us, allow us to speak what only you would have us to speak, and that we may be um, edified and that you may be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the early 2000s, um, there was a TV show um, called Making the Band. Making the Band was an instant hit um, where fans got to watch the full process of what it takes to put a band together. Thousands of singers and musicians from all over the world would come and compete for a spot in the band. And after the final cuts were made, the band would end up consisting of five people that would live together, record an album, release the album, and then go on tour. The process to become a part of the band required a lot of hard work, long hours, sometimes loss of sleep, and sacrifice away from friends and family, but most of all, the buy-in of the concept of one band and one sound. Many of them coming from different cities, different backgrounds, different styles, but in spite of their differences, they were willing to put aside all of their differences for the sake of making the band. The person of, in charge of the band deciding who would make the band was a well-known producer by the name of Sean Combs. Some call him Diddy. Some call him Puff Daddy. Some just call him Puffy. Some call them other things um, that we won't get into. Um, and if you need more information on that, you can look them up online and find out all you need to know. And I'm not going to get into that. But at times during the show, um, it has been said that he was a bit over the top, a little mean, a little too aggressive. And then a lot of what he did didn't take all of that. Matter of fact, on one episode, um, I didn't look, I didn't see it. Somebody told me this. Uh, but one of the episodes, um, it showed Diddy making the members of the band uh, walk a long distance to get him some cheesecake. 
And it was said and rumored that when they finally got back from their long journey, he was gone. It is kind of mean, huh? But Diddy's challenges and activities on the show were often ridiculed. And when he was asked why he chose that method, he responded, it was necessary and it was the only way to see who really wanted it. Now, although I was not a fan of the show because of the drama and the ratchetness um, that took place, the creators of the show were on one accord with the goal in mind of making the band. So when God wanted to shake up the world, he sent his son Jesus to this earth to gather 12. And unlike Diddy, or Pub Daddy, whatever you want to call him, he loved on them, dwelled among them, taught them, he made them a band. Not a group of musicians or singers, but men from various walks of life. Some saved, some unsaved, some cussers, some fighters, some fishermen, some tax collectors, you name it. Now, I know um, we just finished the Olympics, and uh, the Olympic team, basketball team, just won gold. Um, but this particular team of 12, coached by Jesus, would be considered the greatest lineup ever assembled. And like with any band or any team, no one plays forever. So therefore, at times, empty slots may need to be filled. So this morning, I said all that to say that God sent word for those who will hear and will receive that he is once again making the band. Look at your name and say, do you want to be in the band? I pray the answer is yes, because if not, uh, we need to have a whole different conversation. This morning, I want to share with you four things that God is looking for when he is making the band, when he's creating the band, when he is forming us together, when he's putting us together on one accord, one band, one sound. First thing is, God is making a band that has the proper posture. Somebody say proper posture. Let me start by saying that looking good is important. I believe in looking good. You should, and all of y'all look good, just in case nobody told you, you look great. But a band has to do more than just look good. And can I suggest to you that our unity has nothing to do with our uniform? And I didn't ask for permission from the worship team, but I'm going to use them for an example because they love me and they won't get mad at me. I'll see y'all Tuesday. Um... When we rehearse every week, we go over what we're going to sing that Sunday, and then we also go over what we're going to wear. Sometimes everyone is cool with what a certain person decides we're going to put on. And sometimes we get faces because they may not be a fan of what was picked. But at the end of the day, everybody complies. Unless I think they do. We don't. They might have a little side conversation that I'm not privileged to. And if I find out, um, I'll just give you a hug. But here's the thing. Um, when we stand up here, we look like we're together. Same color combination, same schemes. We try to fit in with the, all the stuff that we see. We try to put it all together, make it look presentable. Sometimes you have, sometimes we even go so far that somebody might show up with the same shirt or the same shoes. It's happened before. But what if we went through all of that coordinating, coordinate, but we were on different pages? <laughs> Not getting along and talking about each other, thinking we sing better than the other one, just all jacked up. And I'm not saying that happens here at your cousin's church. They do that. But we look good, though. We look good. We got this, it all figured out. But what good would it do for us to be in uniform but not be unified? 
Mm. My wife and I can buy matching outfits, take all the pictures we want, post them on social media, fill up y'all timeline with all the cliches and the hashtags. But it does no good that if while y'all are liking and commenting, we're at home fighting. Not talking to each other, can't stand each other. But the likes and the comments steady coming. Ooh, y'all look so good. Power couple, happy to like all of that. We are merely wearing the uniform. Help me, God. But we are lacking unity. <laughs> Uniformity, but no unity. We look good on the outside, but if you catch us at the house, as a matter of fact, this has never happened to nobody in here, so let me just say, I've seen it, but it wasn't none of y'all. <laughs> Have you ever been somewhere and you saw a couple and you did and they didn't know you saw them? <laughs> and they sitting at a restaurant and you could tell they're having a bad day? But they don't think nobody see them. They beefing and they having all this uh, heated fellowship. <laughs> Not knowing that people are observing them. Because we saw them before with the uniform on. But when you look behind closed doors, there is no unity. As the church, as the body of Christ, help me God, the called out ones... For years, we have shown the world our uniform. <sighs> and boy, don't we look good. When I say we look good, I mean we look Tony the Tiger great good. And while we look good, I believe that what we are witnessing is the removal of the uniform and the exposing of the lack of unity. 2 Timothy, 3, 2 Timothy 3 and 5, let me hurry up so I won't get in trouble. New King James Version talks about having a form of godliness. Who is the Bible reading? But denying the power thereof. And y'all know I had to go to the message version. That's the hood version. That's the version I like. It says, they'll make a show of religion. And when you read the message, it can't even make you, you move a little different when you read it. They make a show of religion. But behind the scenes, they're animals. I didn't write it. I promise I didn't write this. It says, stay clear <laughs> of these kind of people. Imagine where we would be if in the upper room, they only had the uniform. <laughs> if they would have made a show of religion, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Meaning we are just fine wearing a uniform, but not being in uniform or unified. Unity is not merely the absence of conflict, but is the, it is the presence of collaboration. When we come together in worship, it is the posture of our hearts that determine the depths of our connection with God. You see, I'm not a doctor, but from what I hear, our hearts are not just organs. They are the seat of our emotions, our desires, and our intentions. So our text this morning says that they were in the upper room all together in one place. So let me start by saying this, that God is making a band, first of all, that has the proper posture. Number two, God is making a band that is in position to move. Somebody say position. When the text says they were all together in one place, it not only meant the location, but the place and the position of their heart. The position of obedience. I know for a lot of us, man, that's a tough word. Because we, we don't like people telling us what to do giving us instruction because we, we I got this. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need you to tell me anything. I'm, I'm, I'm cool. I've been to school. 
I got degrees. I'm smart. I don't, I, don't, I don't need you to tell me what to do. I don't need your instructions. But obedience is a requirement for a move of God. And I can only imagine what would have happened had Noah not obeyed. Maybe there wouldn't be any chickens had he not obeyed. No steaks, no burgers, no eggs, no bacon, no ham. You get it. We'd probably be feasting on juices and berries had he not obeyed. Without obedience, the walls of Jericho would never have come down if the children of Israel had not obeyed. The guests at the wedding in Cana would have been stuck drinking Aquafina instead of Zinfandel. I know y'all don't know what that is. Bishop, that's what I found. I, I, don't, I never had that. I'm just telling you this is what I read. That's what I read. They would have been drinking Aquafina instead of Zinfandel had they not obeyed God when he said to fill up the jugs with water. <sighs> Some of us in this room would have probably married the wrong person had we not obeyed God when he said, run! <laughs> run, run as fast as you can, is what he said. Okay, all right, so, so let, let me stop. We get the point, we get the point. We often hear the phrase that obedience is better than sacrifice. And as a, I once heard a preacher once say that all sacrifice does is try to make up for what obedience would have done in the first place. Pentecost and the upper room was all about the posture of their hearts and their position to hear God and to obey. Now, thousands of years have passed and we're still talking about Pentecost. 120 people in one place, one moment that would change the world forever. And one of the most amazing parts about that moment is in verse 4 when it says that everyone in the room was filled. Not one person was left out. God did what he did for everybody that was in the room. All 120 people in the room received the Holy Spirit. And what God wants to do in this season is for everybody. And can I pause and can I tell God personally, thank you for not leaving me out? <sighs> I'll speak for me. I, I know that I did not deserve to be included, but he included me anyway. That there are some things that I have done and said and thought in my life that should have excluded me, but by the grace of God, he included me and allowed me to make the band. Somebody just shout, thank you for including me. So we're moving. So we've talked about posture. We've talked about position. Third thing is God is making a band that has power. Somebody say power. Before his ascension, Jesus promised his followers in Acts 1 and 8. says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when I was doing research, one of the names of the Holy Spirit was the word fire. Somebody shout fire. fire. So if I was to rephrase Acts 1 and 8 with the word fire, it would go like this. But you shall receive power when the fire comes upon you. Somebody just shout fire. fire. One more time. Somebody just shout fire. fire. I ran across a pretty cool story that I want to share with you about the Yosemite Firefall. For decades, the Yosemite Firefall became the most famous attraction at Yosemite National Park in California. It's said that each evening in the summer, a roaring bonfire was built at the edge of the glacier point, which towers about 3,200 feet above the Yosemite Valley. By sundown, it is said that hundreds of spectators would gather below the edge of the glacier point. And at around 9 p.m. sharp, the master of ceremony 
would come out and he would shout, let the fire fall. And at that moment, the glowing bonfire will be pushed over the edge, creating a glittering waterfall of fire. It was an amazing thing to see people would come from everywhere to see the fire fall. Years later, a man comes because he had heard about it and he came to see what the hype was all about. But to his disappointment, when he arrived, he was told, I'm sorry, man, but the fire doesn't fall here anymore. Now, wouldn't it be a shame if someone who had heard of the fire of God and how amazing it was, how powerful it was, how life-changing it was, how cleansing it was, came to the house of God only to find out that the fire no longer falls. That's why it is important that we praise and that we worship God freely with our boundaries so that the fire never ceases. Somebody say, let the fire fall. Let the fire fall. Now, last week, we talked about our need for fresh oil. So this week, we're thanking God for fresh oil. We're also asking him for fresh fire. Somebody say fresh fire. Now, in the natural, fire can be dangerous, but in the spirit, fire is necessary. And during my study time, I looked up fresh fire, and it said that fire, fresh fire symbolizes the, the presence of God and the fresh supply of God. And I thought, man, that's pretty good, the presence of God with fresh supply. So let's go back to Acts 1 and 8. And it will say something like this, but you shall receive power when the presence of God comes upon you. You shall receive power when the fresh supply of God comes upon you. So like the fresh oil from last week that causes things to slide off because remember I told you I'm so oily, we're so oily. God is saying, not only will I cause it to slide off of you, but I will supply you with fresh oil to burn it up. Uh, the fresh fire to burn up depression. The fresh fire to burn up cancer. The fresh fire to burn up high blood pressure. The fresh fire to burn up anxiety. The fresh fire to burn up what tried to destroy me. The fresh fire to burn up the plan of the enemy. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. let it burn. Let it burn. So we're moving. I'm almost done. One more time. Somebody just shout fresh fire. Fresh fire. Hmm. The, the, it's the kind of fire. <laughs> when I was growing up, the old saints would repeat Jeremiah. Say, it's like fire. Shut up in my bones. Like, I, I'm trying to contain it. I'm trying to be cool. I got somebody sitting next to me. They don't really know me like that. I don't want to scare them. But I'm thinking about how good God has been. <laughs> I'm thinking about where he brought me from. And the more I think about it, the more the fire boils up and it burns on the inside. Next thing I know, I can't help but lift my hands and tell them thank you. I'm shouting hallelujah. I'm spinning around. I'm doing all kinds of stuff I wouldn't normally do because the fire is burning inside. <sighs> have you ever had, Jared, have you ever had the fire burning inside of you somewhere and you're trying your best to contain yourself, but you can't because it won't stop burning. We need the fire of God that will burn up and consume everything that is not like him. Somebody shall let it burn. <sighs> so we have to have posture, position, power, and the last thing is God is making a band that carries the sound of praise. There is something powerful about hearing a band playing together as one unit. 
And I know y'all didn't think I was going to preach an entire sermon and not uh, give a personal story. You couldn't have thought that. Um, a few years ago, I was blessed to go to college and to attend um, the world-famous Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and if nothing else, uh, I went to Jackson State, and this is just, just how I feel, that I went to Jackson State to meet my wife. I know you're supposed to go for education. I got that. That was cool. <laughs> I went to class and all that. Uh, we, I did that. But I feel like I went to school to meet my wife. I put this charm and this game on her. <laughs> now, mind you, I'm going to stand over here and say this. Mind you, I was terrible. I was whack. I'm going to stand on the side and say it on this side. But it's by the grace of God. And it's Holy Spirit that empowered me to be able to say something or do something. I don't even know what I said or what I did, but God is good. <laughs> so we got married, had two amazing kids, moved to Chicago. Then we moved to Kansas City. And now I'm here preaching to you today. But one of the highlights of going to Jackson State was the band. And this is before Deion Sanders had y'all watching all the football games and being all hype and you wearing the t-shirt you never been there before. But it was something electric about the band. The band was called the Sonic Boom of the South. And the band was considered one of the best bands in the nation. Yeah, we had the best band, I'm sorry. Uh, in my opinion, we, we were number one. Think what you want to think. When it's your turn to preach, you can say who your favorite band was. Since I got the mic, the best band in the land is the Sonic Boom of the South. And I remember it being early in the morning, and you would hear them marching around the campus playing. And it eventually became my alarm clock. Because there was something about the power of the sound that drew me, that got me up out of my sleep, that no matter what time... I went to bed. I could count on waking up here. The band drum would come. Boom, ba-doom, 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 boom, ba-doom. And everybody would get hyped and just start moving around the dorm because they heard the sound. Theologians, you see what I'm saying? The theologians have said that when the people were in the upper room together, on one accord, that the sound that came from the upper room not only impacted those that were in the room, but it drew people that were passing by. <laughs> there should be such a sound that comes from our churches that when people drive by, they are drawn just not to our churches, but drawn to the presence of God. The Holy Spirit we re represented as a mighty rushing wind at Pentecost signified a radical shift. Somebody say radical shift in the world. The sound of a mighty wind did not just fill the space, but it filled the people. But just like I used to hear the sonic boom play, I can hear the sound of the church coming back. Uh, the sound of a people on one accord. The sound of an army of people that would praise him in spite of what's going on. Later on in Acts chapter 2 around verse 12, and I'm almost done. It says, it talked about how the sound of praise filled the upper room and the people came to see what was going on. And they assumed that the people were drunk. Talking about the Ziffender earlier. They assumed that they were drunk and they began to mock them and ask, How can this be? These people in this room and this, this chaos is going on, this sound is happening, everybody is coming and it's, it's drawing and they can see the fire and feel the fire. How can this be happening? Because if you remember, 
These people were not family members. These were not the same people. These were 120 people from different places. How can it be that all these people have come together to create this sound? They must be drunk on cheap wine is what the scripture said. Uh, Check out Paul's response in verse 14. It says, then Peter stepped forward with the 11 apostles and shouted to the crowd. Listen, all of you visitors and residents of Jerusalem. Some of you are saying that these men are drunk. It's not true. It's much too early for that. People don't get drunk at 9 a.m. That's what he said. He said, no, what you're seeing this morning was predicted centuries ago by the prophet Joel. Then in the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind. Your son and your daughter shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. So as I go to my seat, I'm a close here declaring that this house, somebody shout this house, will be a house that carries the sound. That when we praise, we praise from a place of victory. That when we praise, we praise from a place of freedom. That when we praise be, before we praise before the battle is over, because we don't have to wait until the battle is over to shout. We will be a house that will shout just on the thought of what God's going to do. There will be a praise from this place of faith that says, I may not be able to see it right now, but I will praise him while it's coming. And not only do I declare that for this house, but I declare it for my house and I declare it for your house that you haven't seen nothing yet. And I dare you when you get home to walk around your house and fill it with praise. I dare you to begin to just say, God, have your way in this place. Fill this place with your glory. Fill this place with your power. I feel good. Fill this place with your anointing. Have your way in this place. I bind every demon and every devil that will try to come against the power of God. This morning, I'm crazy enough to believe God for an upper room experience. If God can do it with 120, he can do it in a room right now. I don't know about you, but I need fresh oil. I need fresh fire. I don't know about you, but I can hear the sound of praise. I can hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And if you know that you need the fresh oil and you need the fresh fire, I dare you to get out of your seat and make your way to this altar and begin to cry out to God for fresh oil, fresh fire, fresh wind. Let the oil of God flow. Let the fire consume. Let the fresh wind blow. Holy Ghost fire, we call on you now. Blow in this room. I said the fresh wind of God blow in this room we need you like never before holy spirit have your way this is the sound the sound of one band the sound of one sound your children we cry out for more of you your children we cry out for you to have your way anoint me afresh Touch me again. Anoint me afresh. Touch me again. If you need to repent, go ahead and repent. If you need to be filled, be filled in the name of Jesus. Whatever you need, it's in the room right now. Somebody just shout, feel me. Come on, somebody shout, feel me with your power. And ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you let me declare to you now that the Holy Ghost is in the room right now 
Thank you so much for watching this message, and we pray that it encourage you. Our vision is to help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference so that they can live a better life. And if you would like to partner with us in giving, you can text ECIM with your giving amount to 77977 or visit us on our website. Also, be sure to like and subscribe and check out our other sermons as well. Our service begins every Sunday at 10 o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time. Now go out and live a better life.